Live stream audio test, one, two.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's two o'clock, so the inquiry is now resumed. Um, first point, um, the, uh, the document, um, the Parish Council um, study. Did we get to a conclusion as to whether that is to be submitted or not? We're content for it to go in, sir. Okay, thank you. So have you got uh, copies? So if that, that can be put on the, the list of documents that submitted. Um, are you, you, you said that you, uh, Mr. Leader, that you um, wanted that to be a core document, is, is that? Well, it could be, or you can just make an inquiry document, sir. There is a bundle of relevant landscape documents that would seem to sit naturally with them, but if you want to make an inquiry document instead, fine. Whatever suits you. All right, so just for the avoidance of doubt, well, it's been handed to me, so we'll, we'll put it on the inquiry documents yep. list. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything else that anybody wants to draw to my attention? Well, sir, so we've, we've um, amended the document that uh, we were going to submit on housing lands to a form that is now agreed by both parties. So perhaps when we break, that could be handed in by uh, Ms. Richards. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Not for me. Okay. All right. So this afternoon, really, um, we'll focus on here in the uh, council's landscape uh, and visual evidence. Um, so it's over to you, uh, Mr. Leader. Would you please call your witness? Thank you very much, sir. I'll call Mr. John Etchells, who's sitting to your right, sir. Um, Mr. Etchells, you're John Etchells of... Uh, John Etchells Consulting Limited, which is a registered practice of the Landscape Institute. You hold an MA in Geography from the University of Cambridge and a Bachelor of Philosophy degree in Landscape Design from the University of Newcastle upon Tyne. And you're a chartered member of the Landscape Institute, is that correct? Uh, that's correct, yes. And you tell us in your proof of evidence that you provided evidence on landscape and visual matters at more than 70 planning appeals, most of them determined by a public inquiry. And you also tell us that your evidence, which is contained within your proof, and um, four appendices that are attached to it, have been prepared in accordance with the guidance of your professional institute. And can you just confirm, having um, I hope read your evidence recently, that everything in it remains true and uh, reflects your professional opinion? It does, yes. Thank you. Well. Um, we have your proof, we have the four appendices that you submitted with it, and there is the additional document that was handed in this morning, um, which will come to in due course. And at page 47 of your evidence, you have prepared a summary of what is in your main proof. And so with uh, your permission, what I'd like to ask Ms. Reschels to do is read through his summary because it may be that there are others who've not read the evidence that are listening and as he goes through his evidence what i shall want to do from time to time is ask him to elaborate on one or two points would that be satisfactory sir thank you very much so mr rettles if you'd like to pick your summary up please and read from 8.1 the uh, the site for the proposed development is close to but outside the settlement boundary for churchill and is therefore in the countryside the site comprises three fields, two larger rectangular fields which make up its main northern part, and a smaller field to the south which adjoins the junction between Front Street, Churchill Green and Church Lane. Just pausing there, can everybody hear Mr. Etchells? Are you struggling? Yeah, if you could just perhaps speak a bit closer to the mic. Thank you. 
The southern two fields, more than half the site area, are within the Churchill Conservation Area, and the Grade 1 listed building of St John the Baptist Church is on the west side of Church Lane, opposite the northwestern corner of the site. The church tower is a prominent and characteristic local landmark. There are two veteran trees within the central field, which are prominent and distinctive features of the local landscape. Two public footpaths cross the site, one leading across it to the northwest, directly towards the church, though the route appears to have been diverted around the edge of the field by the landowner. I understand from the council that there has been no application to officially divert the footpath and that its official route remains as indicated on the Ordnance Survey mapping. And the other running across its southeastern corner towards Windmill Hill, which is a popular local walking route and viewpoint. The site is within the setting of the Mendip Hills AOMB and there are distinctive and attractive views towards the line of wooded hills within the AOMB, both from within the site and from Windmill Hill across the site. Now, just pausing there, uh, in your Appendix B, there's a bundle of photographs. And we know the inspector has seen the site, so we don't need to trawl through these at great length. However, what I'd like you to do, if you would, please, is select those which you think are going to be most helpful in articulating your evidence on both the condition of the site as we see it today and uh, the effects of the development. So would you like to take us to a select few photographs that really allow you to draw out the key points? Uh, yes, if we just look at a few of them, we start with photograph one. Um, that is from within the site, uh, looking uh, west across the site from its eastern boundary. Uh, so you can see there, sir, the, the nature of the two northern uh, fields Within the site, you can see the tower of the village church towards the right. Uh, you can see the trees along the site boundary. The trees in the centre of the view are around Churchill Court. And you can see the veteran sycamore tree within the central field within the site towards the left of the view. And you can just see part of the school uh, beyond the vegetation on the left of the view. Uh, and I'll just point out in several of my photographs, there appears to be quite a lot of construction activity on the site, but as I understand it, that was the archaeological trial trenching which was underway at the time. So that's why there's a, a large machine and various mounds of spoil in some of the photographs. Um, photograph five, if we move on to that, uh, again shows a mound of spoil in the foreground, uh, but this is looking southwest from the northeastern part of the site. Uh, again, looking across the, the two main fields within the site towards Front Street. Uh, and what I'd point out here in particular is uh, you can obviously see the wooded hills within the AONB on the skyline. Uh, you can see some houses along Front Street which are within the conservation area, uh, but others you can't see uh, further to the right in the view. They are well screened by vegetation to their north so that the the site visually is quite well separated from the edge of the settlement, even though it does adjoin it relatively closely in terms of uh, plan distance, uh, but it is quite well separated visually. Um, and the other thing I point out here is that behind the sycamore tree on the right of the view, uh, there's reference in my evidence to the uh, west of Barrowfield Cottage appeal decision. Uh, that site, west of Barrowfield Cottage, is effectively behind and slightly to the left of the sycamore tree in that view, behind the, uh, the trees and hedge which run along the site boundary at that point. I have to ask you, where would the school be in relation to that photograph? Uh, the school is uh, just visible on the right edge. The school has a sort of entrance tower which is painted white and you can just see that above the parked car. And again, the parked cars in the field, I think, were to do with the archaeological trial trenching. So, I mean, the inspector will be done with you, but um, some play is made of the uh, visual impact of the school in the local landscape. What would be your view of the uh, importance of the school in the landscape? Uh, well, the, the school is there. It is, uh, there are some relatively large buildings within it, um, and it can be seen more clearly from the elevated views on Windmill Hill. Uh, but in the, in the ground level views from within the site, uh, it is quite well screened from the site and quite well separated. Uh, bear in mind that these photographs were taken in April. Uh, at the moment, you'll have seen, sir, if you've been on site yesterday, 
uh, that the vegetation will have thickened up and in this particular photograph the tower of the school would be less visible now than it is in that photograph. So uh, in, in short, while the, while the presence of the school is clearly relevant, uh, I don't think it has a particularly dominating and certainly from ground level it doesn't have a particularly strong influence on the character of the site and the site is in fact quite well screened and separated from the remainder of the village. I mean, we, we could go on to other photographs, but I think those are the two main views, effectively. It's views towards the church across the site and also views uh, from within the site towards the higher ground of the Mendips. The only other photograph we could perhaps look at is uh, photograph 16, which is from the higher ground of Windmill Hill, looking down onto the site. Um, as I said, the school is slightly more visible because of the elevated nature of the view uh, and the higher ground of the Mendips, the woody hills on the skyline can again be clearly seen. So these are views towards the AONB across the site in which the site effectively makes up the middle ground of the view. Thank you. Well, if those are the only photographs you want to take us to, would you like to read on from 8.3, please? Uh, the, uh, the North Somerset Council Landscape Character Assessment, which has been adopted as supplementary planning guidance, shows a site within the southern part of the River Yeo Rolling Valley Farmland Landscape Character Area J2. The stated landscape guidelines for this area include conserve the rural pastoral character of the area, and the area of and around the site does indeed have a largely rural and pastoral character, despite the adjoining presence of the secondary school. As part of the preparation for the new local plan, NSC have also produced a landscape sensitivity assessment with the aim of assessing the sensitivity of the landscape around settlements where sites could potentially be allocated for residential development to contribute to the site selection process and also to provide a sound basis for the future determination of planning applications. The area of and around the site was determined in this assessment to be of high sensitivity. More recently, Churchill Parish Council have commissioned a landscape sensitivity study for the parish as part of the preparation for a new neighbourhood plan. And that assessment too found the area of and around the site to be of high sensitivity. This would be a significant development of up to 62 new houses of two or two and a half storeys in height between the edge of the settlement and the village church and listed buildings around it. The site is enclosed by roadside hedges along its western and southern boundaries and the access proposals would lead to the removal of significant but not quantified in the application. Uh, I just point out now that the, the, uh, the lengths of loss of hedgerows have now been quantified uh, in uh, Mr Cook's rebuttal uh, evidence uh, which we can talk about in a minute. And uh, Dr. Jacob did also refer, I think, earlier on to the, the loss of the hedgerows as being a significant factor. So significant lengths of those hedges and the construction of a new raised table at the junction of Front Street and Church Lane, which would need to be lit. The combined effects of those proposals alone would have some locally significant effects upon, upon the presently largely rural character of the roads, but they would also have the effect of significantly opening up views into the site and of the new houses along the axes and through the potentially extensive gaps created in the existing hedges. Right, just pausing there, at 8.3, you told us about various sensitivity studies, and we know that there's a dispute between you and Mr Cook as to the sensitivity of the appeal site. Tell me, why would one bother producing a study which focuses on sensitivity? What's the point? What does it tell us if we're trying to ask the if we ask the question, how suitable is this land for housing development? Uh, well, the the sensitivity uh, of the landscape. Um, sometimes landscape character assessments will talk about the sensitivity of the landscape in sort of partly abstract terms, uh, not in terms of its sensitivity to particular types of development. But both the uh, council and the parish council sensitivity assessments were specifically geared to judging the sensitivity of potential development sites to residential development. So they, they have specifically looked at one of the main uh, two prongs of a landscape uh, assessment, which you would do 
for development proposals as part of our landscape and visual impact assessments because the two main things you need to judge for that are A, the sensitivity of the receiving landscape and B, the magnitude of change which the development would create. Uh, and then the, the significance of the effects on the landscape are judged by combining the two. And what does sensitivity tell you about the capacity of the landscape to absorb development in a certain uh, well, sensitivity is effectively the inverse of capacity. So a landscape of high sensitivity to residential development would, in general terms, have a low capacity to accept residential development and vice versa. Yeah, good. Thank you. Right. Now, um, you uh, said that we have received a rebuttal from Mr. Cook, which allows you to uh, be more precise about the effect of the scheme on the loss of hedgerows and trees. Would you like to turn up Mr Cook's rebuttal, please? And I'd like to address two points, if you would. First, if you could take us to that part of his rebuttal, which deals with the quantum of loss of hedgerows and trees. And if you could just express a view, please, of how significant that would be. Uh, well, it is probably best to look at his uh, Appendix 2, yeah. um, where he has the drawings, so Appendix 1 and Appendix 2, uh, which have the, I think these are the, uh, I don't think the proposals in terms of highways have changed from the application, but as I understand it, they've been annotated with more uh, precise lengths of uh, the amount of vegetation which would need to be removed. Um, and on these drawings, there's a differentiation between the, the extent of existing hedge to be removed uh, and the extent of existing hedge to be relocated behind visibility splay. So if we look at the uh, first drawing, which is the proposed access off Church Lane, uh, that shows that 17 metres of hedge would be removed where the access has to physically go through it, but that a total of about 109 metres of hedge would need to be relocated behind the visibility splay. So the total on that drawing, uh, which would need to be either removed or relocated, would be 126 metres. And if we then look at the second drawing, which is the, uh, the southern part of the site, so it's got the pedestrian access uh, off Church Lane, the other pedestrian access at the junction, and the vehicular access off Front Street. Uh, and the combination of all of those, uh, I think we're looking at another 118 metres of either loss or translocation with all those three combined, because the pedestrian access off Church Lane uh, also requires substantial lengths of the hedge to be relocated behind the visibility display because obviously people crossing the road to get to the school can't just stumble out into the road. They're, they're, people aren't driving cars need to see them and they need to be able to see the cars. So even though it's only pedestrian access, it still has visibility display requirements. Can you just repeat those figures for me? Um, yeah, I, I've just added them up from the drawing, but uh, my calculation is that there'd be 61 metres of either loss or translocation for the pedestrian access. That's the, the northern one on the drawing. Uh, another 42 metres for the one at the junction and uh, a further 15.5 metres for the vehicular and pedestrian access opposite Hillier's Lane. And the grand total between the two drawings is, by my calculations, about 244 metres. Uh, but also in broad terms, if we put all those drawings together, I think it's somewhere in the region, I haven't measured it accurately, but it's somewhere in the region of half of all the hedges which at the moment enclosed the site. Um, uh, and I've, uh, the, the drawings make a distinction between removal and a translocation. Uh, I've rolled them together in those numbers. But the reason I've done that uh, is if we look at uh, section two of Mr. Cook's rebuttal, He's helpfully provided some images there of what happens with a translocated hedge. Um, and he describes the process that you, you have a, a reasonably mature hedge. If it wasn't that mature, you wouldn't be bothering to translocate it. 
but the first thing you need to do is to cut it back significantly because if you don't do that, it won't survive the translocation. So we've got two images here with the, the, the coppice tegero following translocation. And you can see from that that the hedge has been cut down, so it's approximately 600 millimeters in height. Uh, and then the photograph under that shows the same hedge uh, two years later, where it's also approximately 600 millimeters in height. And in my view, that looks nothing like a hedge at all. So I'm not sure there's a great deal of difference. There may be some nature conservation benefit in translocating, and you get the roots, and you get some of the soil, etc. But in landscape terms, and its ability to form a screen or any kind of enclosure to the site, I don't think there's a significant difference between translocation and removal. You could remove the hedge and replant a new one, and it would probably have grown more than the translocated one within two years. So I think it's reasonable to roll the translocation and the removal together and to say that in broad terms, around half of the length of hedgerows around the site at the moment would go and would lose their present landscape and screening value. So half would go and lose landscape and screening value? Yes, I mean, the, 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 it, well, the, the photographs that Mr. Cook has put in show that there'd be effectively no screening effect after two years, and judging by the, the growth in that two years, no significant screening effect for a long time afterwards. There'd be open views into the site of the new houses. Right, now, I suspect that means we can leave Mr. Cook's rebuttal unless there's anything else you want to say. Uh, the, well, the, the only other thing I would say about it is the, the other component of his rebuttal is um, he's included uh, in his section four the, one of the CPRE tranquility maps. Um, I don't know what he's going to say about that, but I just observe that that tranquility mapping is done at a very broad scale. It's done on one kilometer squares. Um, and it's a very general exercise. And as I understand it, it's a desk exercise based on the proximity of that kilometer square to things like airports and major roads. Um, I don't think it in involved any field work. Um, so it's a very generalized exercise and, it, and it's value in my opinion to a site specific exercise, which is what we're undertaking at the moment, is, is limited. Thank you. So, we had, um, or rather you had, read up until the end of um, 8.4. Is that to read 8.5? The proposed development would be visible and in many cases prominent from an area around the site which would be limited by the high ground of Windmill Hill to the north field boundary trees and woodland to the east, houses along Front Street to the south, and the village church listed buildings and the buildings of the secondary school to the west. This area is relatively tightly drawn around the site, though there are also some more distant views from the higher ground of the AUMB to the south. But within that area, the development would represent a readily visible and locally prominent incursion of built development into what is at present a largely rural, attractive, and distinctive area of countryside which forms the setting to the village, conservation area, and church. Now, just pausing there, Mr. Cook, at page 17, paragraph 421, and page 24, paragraph 537, says, well, we're dealing, and we're dealing with the appeal side, with urban fringe, hairy uh, urban land. What do you say? Uh, well, uh, the, the site is uh, clearly close to the edge of the settlement, but the settlement is a village. Uh, the term urban is normally used in terms of towns or cities, um, and the term urban fringe carries sort of negative or pejorative uh, connotations, and I don't think the site has any of those. Um, the photographs which we were looking at earlier, I don't think we need to go back to them, they, uh, in, in my view, don't show a landscape which is remotely urban fringe. Um, uh, and in that context, I, I would also point out that um, if we look at the uh, 
appellant's heritage evidence. Um, it does have some observations in there as to whether the village has an urban quality or not, and also how much of that can be experienced from the area around the site. So this is uh, Mr. Sutton's proof of evidence. And in Mr. Sutton's paragraph 410, he says that while passing along the footpath that runs through the site, no meaningful experience can be had of the architectural character of the village or the component parts of the conservation area that possess special architectural or historic interest. So he's not talking about the urban fringe character of the site as such, but what he's saying is that if you're within the site, you have no meaningful experience of the rest of the village, uh, which does indicate to me that the... Uh, I mean, I don't think it's urban anyway, but, but the settlement influence of the village on the site is quite limited. Uh, and in his 514, Mr. Sutton goes on to say that uh, he, he's talking about... Uh, he's making another point, but in passing he says, the appeal scheme is, appeal scheme is described as being urban. I do not recognise this characterisation of an extension to the village. To follow the theme of an earlier statement, I also do not characterise the post-war extensions of the village, Orchard Walk and the Drive, as being urban. So again, he's saying there that he doesn't even think that the post-war, more modern parts of the village are urban. So presumably by extension, he, he doesn't think that the, the older parts of the village are urban. So Mr Sutton says on two occasions that he doesn't really think that uh, A, the village is urban, and B, it doesn't have any influence, let alone an urban influence, on the site. Yeah. Now, if you could just turn to page 24 of Mr. Cook's evidence, please. Of Mr. Cook's proof. I beg your pardon, Mr. Cook's proof. We see there a summary, and if we look at the middle of that paragraph. He talks about it having a more urban fringe environment. We just dealt with that. And then he says, whilst this would be lost with the introduction of the scheme, no harm would come about the distinctive rural character of the area as a consequence of the scheme being implemented. Whilst change to the character of the site would occur as an inevitable consequence of development of the Greenfield site, it would change the development that would be in keeping with the settlement in general character of the Second Valley, and as such, the nature of the effect would be neutral rather than adverse. Now, what do you make to that assessment of effect being neutral rather than adverse? Uh, I completely disagree with it. Um, right. Well, in my view, uh, and I think it's evident from the photographs and from looking at the site, uh, the site has a rural pastoral character. Uh, there are some limited views of some of the houses along Front Street uh, above the intervening vegetation. One or, two, one or two of the houses can be seen slightly more clearly through gaps in the vegetation. But the site doesn't have, as we've been discussing, the site doesn't have anything approaching an urban fringe character. Um, the, the site is clearly adjacent to the edge of the settlement, but it is quite well screened from it for the most part. But what the development would introduce is a new housing estate of 62 houses. Um, there's nothing like that uh, in this part of the village. And I don't think there's anything of that scale in the rest of the village. So to say that there'd be neutral effects from the loss of the, the fields which make up the site at the moment and allow the views across it to the church, uh, and bearing in mind that the, the development would be present in the views from Windmill Hill down onto the site and across the site to the AOMB, uh, to describe that as neutral simply for the apparent reason that there are some other houses in the village and these would be new houses next to them, it seems to me to be completely wrong. And as a general approach to the assessment of the suitability of land next to an existing settlement or close to an existing settlement, 
on the basis that suitability for housing development on the basis that you've got a village nearby and the approach is it one you've come across before uh, no, I, I think it, it, it's wrong because it totally ignores the nature and the quality of the land which would be lost. It may be that you may have some areas of land next to settlements which are genuinely urban fringe and degraded, and it may be possible to develop those with quite limited adverse landscape effects, but that's not what we're talking about here. And to adopt that as a blanket principle that you can always develop next to a settlement because you're just putting more houses next to existing houses seems to me to be complete nonsense because it would mean that you, you, you never have to worry about anything as long as you're building next to a settlement you can build anything you like anywhere which clearly can't be the case uh, and what you need to take into account is is the quality sensitivity nature and character of the land which would be lost to the development and i don't think mr cook does that at all doesn't do it at all well, he doesn't seem to from the, the extract we've been looking at. He just seems to make a judgment that because it's next to the settlement, the effects would, by definition, be neutral. Very good. Right. Well, if that's contested, we'll find out soon enough. So, 8.6, please. I have assessed the site and immediately surrounding area as of high landscape quality and high value and high sensitivity to, to development of the type proposed as it has a low ability to accommodate change because such change would lead to some loss of valuable features or elements, chiefly the open land of the site itself and the views of and across that open land, resulting in a significant loss of character and quality. And because the new residential development would be discordant and highly visible in some presently attractive and largely rural views. There would be a medium to high degree of landscape change to the local landscape as a result of the proposed development because the development would occupy a significant proportion of the presently open land at this point and there would be a significant loss of that key characteristic and significant harm to the presently open and attractive views across the site including views to the church and to the hills within the AOMB to the south. My assessment is that there would be high adverse effects on the character of the landscape of and around the site because the development would be at variance with the pattern of the local landscape, would be visually intrusive and would disrupt some important local views, would remove the attractive landscape features of the open fields which make up the site, would introduce a significant scale of development to what is at the moment a largely peaceful pastoral landscape, landscape and could not be adequately mitigated. These effects would be expected to decrease slowly with time as a proposed planting begins to mature. However, they would never disappear completely and some long-term adverse effects, declining to moderate to high adverse after around 15 years, would be likely to persist as a result of the continuing presence of the new dwellings, which may become less visible over time in some views, but they would still be there and the open land would still have been lost. There would also be some significant adverse visual effects, mainly for users of the footpaths which cross the site and the route across Windmill Hill just to its north. The development would also be visible in some longer distance views from the high ground of the AOMB to the south, but in those views would occupy a relatively small part of what are broad, expansive views which also include much of the existing village. So the change in the view would be incremental and there would be much lower level adverse visual effects for these more distant viewpoints. There would therefore be some limited harm to the setting of the AOMB in terms of the views of the, of the development from within the designated area. And there would also be some more significant effects on the setting of the AOMB in terms of the views towards it from Windmill Hill, within which a new development will be highly visible in the foreground and discordant, and also views from the public footpaths across the site, in which the development would obscure most of the existing views to the AONB and significantly affect the context and character of the view where some limited views towards the wooded hills remain. The main effects on these views will be in terms of the harm to the character and quality of the view, but there would also be some significant harm in terms of the ability of viewers to appreciate the wooded hills of the AONB from a distance, and therefore some significant harm to those parts of its setting. When considering the effects of the proposed development of up to 62 new dwellings, it is relevant to note a recent appeal decision for land west of Barrowfield Cottage, which adjoins the southwestern part of the site. That proposal was for five new dwellings only, and the appeal was dismissed in a decision dated 21st December 2021, 
with the inspector finding that the development would, would have a harmful effect on the area's character and appearance. Right, now that decision is a core document, uh, G16. Can we just go to that briefly? Because we'd better just make sure we understand what you're saying and why about that particular decision. Do you have G15 to have? Uh, I do, yes. Let's just identify the document and make sure we're talking about the same thing. Uh, my G15 is a decision by an inspector. Jones, made on the 21st of December 2021. Is that the same document? Uh, it is, yes. Good. And we see that, as you say, it appears on section 78 of the Act, outline application being considered there, perhaps five open market dwellings. The inspector is able to identify where that site is, 300 pounds, and we're going to look at that. But what I'm keen to understand is how this appeal is, is relevant to the evidence you're now giving, because you see, we see under main issues at paragraph three, main issues are the effect of the proposal on the character and appearance of the surrounding area, having particular regard the Churchill Conservation Area and trees on site. I don't need to read on, I don't think. So, um, noting that that is the main issue, would you please like, would you, would you please take us to that part of this decision? which sheds light on uh, the extent to which your view of the uh, landscape impact of the scheme might be correct. Yes, it, it's really paragraph 16, I think, yeah. uh, which says it would therefore have a harmful effect on the area's character and appearance. Um, I mean, it's not completely clear from that extract what the inspector means by the areas. But bearing in mind what you've just said of the main issues, the character and appearance of the surrounding area, uh, but also with particular regard to the conservation area, I mean, it, 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 it may be that the inspector was referring to the character and appearance of the area in general, or it may be that he was talking about the conservation area. But I think either way, if he's talking about the character and appearance of the area in general, and he found that there'd be a harmful effect from five houses only, on a quite well-screened and well-contained site, clearly the harm resulting from 62 houses on a, on a much less well-contained site would be greater. But even if he were there referring to the conservation area, I think the point still holds in that uh, if, if he's saying that that development would have a harmful effect on the conservation area, then again, uh, the majority of the site is within the conservation area. Uh, and I haven't done the calculation, but if the majority of the site area is within the conservation area, then presumably more than half the houses would be in the conservation area. So we'd be talking about somewhere over 30 houses within the conservation area, as opposed to five, which this inspector found harmful. Yeah, and if we read on through that paragraph, we see there his assessment of its conflict with relevant landscape, as well as, well, relevant landscape policies, actually. Um, and uh, he has something to say about the natural environment and impact on the local area generally. Well, those points can be put to Mr. Cook in due course. Thank you. Anything else you want to take us to in this decision? Uh, not from that, no. Good. Well, then, let's close that up, put it away, and move on. So, you'd got to the end of 8.12. 8.13, please. Uh, turning to the putative reason for refusal, this relates to harm to the distinctive rural character and landscape setting of the village and the amenity of public rights of way. And the main issues set out in the inspector's note of the case management conference for the appeal included effects on the character and appearance of the area and the landscape. My assessment is that there would be significant and long-term harm in all of those respects. Much of the distinctive rural character and landscape setting at this point would be lost and replaced by built development, and there would be high-level adverse effects on local landscape character and on people using the public footpaths across the site and Windmill Hill. In summary, I would therefore conclude that the stated reason for refusal, insofar as it relates to my evidence, is fully justified and is, in essence, a simple statement of the effects and the resultant policy conflict which would result from the proposed development. Now, we haven't quite finished because just picking up that last point about policy conflict, do you have a copy of uh, core strategy policy CS5? If you haven't, I can hand you one up. I 
I do. I, I quote it in my evidence. Yeah, you do. It's um, for your uh, benefit, sir, core document A1, and it is page 40 within CD A1. And um, in opening, I touched upon the approach to the interpretation and application of this policy was adopted by Mr. Cook. And as you uh, approached your evidence, you had in mind CS5 and what it said. Um, tell me, uh, how do you approach policy CS5? Specifically, do you separate out uh, landscape character as a resource in its own right from visual amenity and apply the policy only to the former and disregard the latter. Do you think that's the correct approach? Uh, no, I don't think it is. Um, I mean, landscape and visual effects are, are uh, considered separately and are assessed separately and are covered separately in the GLVIA. Uh, but they are separate but related. You can't divorce uh, matters of appearance from matters of landscape character. Uh, and policy CS5, in any case, doesn't just talk about the character of the landscape. It talks about the character, distinctiveness, diversity, and quality. Uh, and all of those, in my view, have some uh, visual component. Um, I mean, I think Mr. Cook's argument, as I understand it, is he's tried to separate out character uh, and anything visual or to do with appearance and said that because the character isn't affected because of what we spoke about just now in terms of, of the, the site being residential and the character of the village already being residential, that's how he, he comes to neutral effects. And so he says that because the policy only relates to character and the character is neutral, there's no conflict with the policy. But I think that's making a totally uh, artificial distinction that there is, as I just said, clearly uh, a difference between landscape and visual effects, but to say that there is no visual component whatsoever to, effect, to assessing effects on the landscape, in, in my view, must be clearly wrong. And I, I do address this in my introduction, in my policy, in my paragraph 2.3.1, where I say towards the end of that, uh, talking about landscape and visual effects, and that there is normally a distinction drawn between them in assessments. Uh, I go on to say that though assessed separately, there is a link between the two, with effects on the landscape largely being experienced in terms of views, and views largely being affected by how the landscape in the view changes. There is clearly a significant degree of overlap between the two. Yeah, well, um, we can see whether there are any questions to you about that approach, but otherwise I'll put the point to Mr. Cook now. Um, turning then to Mr. Cook's evidence. Perhaps we ought to pick up the table that was put in this morning as our point of departure. And um, just tell me, what was the point of compiling this table and how does it allow us to uh, assess Mr. Cook's evidence, rather the reliability of Mr. Cook's evidence, as a body of work that accurately evaluates the landscape effects of this proposal and its visual impact? Uh, well, there are some clear differences, uh, not only between my evidence and Mr. Cook's, but also between Mr. Cook's evidence and the uh, landscape and visual impact assessment, which was submitted with the application uh, and was prepared by Mr. Cook's office, although, as I understand it, not by Mr. Cook himself. Mm. Uh, so it's really to, to draw out those differences for, for the inspector's benefit, uh, but also in terms of sensitivity, as we've discussed, there are, there are effectively five assessments of sensitivity uh, because we have the, uh, the council's sensitivity assessment produced by Ward on Armstrong and the parish sensitivity study, uh, plus my evidence, plus the LVIA submitted with the application, uh, and also Mr. Cook's evidence. Um, and in terms of sensitivity, myself, Wardle Armstrong and the parish all say that the area of and around the site is of high sensitivity. Uh, the LVIA didn't consider sensitivity for the immediate area around the site 
but considered it for the whole of the uh, uh, landscape character area w within which the site lies, which is an extensive area around 18 kilometres in width, which also includes the M5 motorway. And the LVIA found the sensitivity to be medium to high, even though it, the overall area is, includes quite large settlements and the motorway. Uh, Mr. Cook, by contrast, finds the sensitivity of the site and surrounding area to be low. So it's really just to point out that there is a significant discrepancy there between the other four assessments and Mr. Cook's. And um, just for the inspector's note, Mr. Cook's assessment, and to make sure I'm also going to put the right point to him in due course. Um, if we turn to page 23 of Mr. Cook's evidence and look at paragraph 5.27, we see there a heading, Author's Assessment of Landscape Character. But above that, at 5.26, there is a paragraph where Mr. Cook, first of all, notes what Ward Armstrong says and then makes an assessment at the, in the final sentence, mindful of the strong edge of settlement character of the site itself, I consider the site to be of low susceptibility, value and sensitivity. Is that the part of his evidence from which you derive his assessment of sensitivity, or is it somewhere else? I think he says it in more than one location, but yeah. that is one of the areas, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and as I said, I, I don't agree that the site has a strong edge of settlement character. But what I would also say in that context is that uh, he's effectively saying there that uh, if you, the, the Wardell Armstrong assessment uh, is of a wide area, and once you take into account the edge of settlement character of the site, the sensitivity can be uh, knocked down. I mean, he's not saying knocked down one level, he's saying knocked down to the lowest level. Uh, but I don't agree with that anyway, because Wardell Armstrong were carrying out a sensitivity assessment of land on the fringes of the settlements. They clearly knew that the village was there and they clearly took that into account in their assessment uh, and still decided it was high. It's not something that they didn't take into account because they weren't looking specifically enough. Yeah, second. Good. Right, so that uh, deals with the issue of uh, various experts' views of the sensitivity of the appeal site. Um, now, you also said a moment ago that there were some differences between what Mr. Cook has to say and that which his own firm had to say when it produced its LVIA. Now, what I'm not wanting to do is nitpick. What I would like to do, please, is understand any significant differences between the work prepared by Pegasus in a non-inquiry situation and that which we are now looking at by way of evidence in a contentious situation. Can you draw out the main and material differences, please? Uh, yes, there, there really is, as set out in the table. Um, I mean, first of all, landscape value. Uh, yeah. uh, and there's no issue here between Mr. Cook's evidence and the Pegasus LVIA of, of looking at different areas or different scales or anything else. They were both assessing the effects of this development on this site. Mm. Um, so in terms of landscape value, the Pegasus LVIA found, well, in this case, they are looking at a wider area, they're looking at the entire landscape character area. They found that to be medium, high, medium to high in terms of value, and Mr. Cook found it to be low for the site. Uh, but if we then look at the effects, uh, then we've got, uh, under landscape effects, the bottom line, uh, we've got effects on the landscape character area. This is the River Year Rolling Valley farmland. Uh, so this isn't the site, this is a character area. Uh, Mr. Cook says no material change. The LVIA found minor to moderate, minor to moderate adverse effects. Uh, and in terms of visual effects, they're, they're, they, were, they, they each found up to major adverse, but Mr. Cook did downgrade some of the effects on views from the AOMB. So that the main differences are the ones 
highlighted in the table, really, which are in terms of the value of the sensitivity uh, and the effects on the landscape character area. It's difficult to c compare it directly across because Mr. Cook did consider uh, landscape effects on the site and surrounds which he considered to be neutral. Uh, the Pegasus LVI didn't consider effects at that level, but did consider uh, effects on the whole landscape character area and found them still to be adverse. And in my view, if you're looking at what they assessed as minor to moderate adverse effects of this development on the whole landscape character area, then if you narrow it down and look at a much smaller area around the site, the effects of the same development on that smaller area would be much higher. So the implication of what the LVIA is saying is, is I think, that if you narrowed it down and just looked at effects of that development on the area around the site, they would be greater than minor to moderate adverse. Yes. No. That, I think, deals with, <coughs> excuse me, the principal differences between Mr. Cook, his own firm, and other experts. Unless there's anything uh, you are very keen to add, Mr. Rashaws, I'm conscious that my time is almost up. I said an hour, we've had 52 minutes. Is there anything else that you would like to uh, draw to the inspector's attention uh, when it comes to, if you like, on the one hand, comparing the case that you advanced on behalf of the council with that now advanced by Mr. Cook? Uh, no, I don't think so. The, the other aspect of the table is that I do find the adverse effects on the landscape to be at a significantly higher level than Mr. Cook, uh, but I think that goes back to his ideas about the character of the development being complementary to the character of the village and therefore the effects will be neutral. Yeah. I don't agree with that and that's the main, well, that's one reason why my assessment of the adverse landscape effects is higher. The other one is that in my view, Mr. Cook has uh, underestimated the sensitivity of the landscape. So if I could just pick up one last point with you, um, the AONB. Um, now, you consider the impact of the development from the AONB, and I hope um, you're able to summarize what you think that would be in relatively pithy terms. Uh, effects on views from the AONB of the development. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I've considered those in terms of visual effects, and just to make sure I get it right, um, I have said that, that uh, I, I've said that the uh, effect, visual effects on those views would be negligible, in yeah. my view, because while you can see the site from the AMB, and the viewpoints are obviously elevated, and so you're looking down onto the village, uh, you can see the site. I think in some of those views, at least, you would see uh, new roofs of the roofs of new houses within the development, but you would be seeing those roofs in context of views which already include the roofs of most of the other houses in the village. So the change would be incremental, and also the views are very expansive. You can see most of the village, you can see other settlements in the distance. So because the views are distant, and because the uh, development would make a relatively small incremental change to the view as a whole, my, my uh, assessment is that the uh, level of effects on those particular views would be negligible. Good. So now we've cleared that up, there's another particular perspective you um, take, which is views towards the area notably from within the appeal site and from Windmill Hill. Yep. Now, tell us, how significant are those views, both with, both with and without the development? Uh, well, w without the development, they're very attractive views. Uh, from Windmill Hill across the site to the woody hills of the OMB, they're attractive, pleasant, open views. Uh, the school is visible off to the right, but in a direct line between Windmill Hill and the AOMB, you're looking across fields, you can see part of the conservation area, but the houses within the conservation area are quite well screened. If you go further down the hill, you can see the church tower off to the right. Uh, so they're, they're pleasant, attractive views. Um, with the development in place, there would be a new housing estate in the middle ground of your view. You would still have views to the hills above the site because you're standing on Windmill Hill and you're looking towards other high ground but the quality and nature and character of the view would be significantly affected. 
and those, those are views towards the AOMB, uh, noting that uh, views to the Wooded Hills are noted in the AOMB management plan as being one of the special qualities of the AOMB. Yeah. Now, it might be said, well, look, come on, Mr. Etchells, there are lots of opportunities to see hills from outside the AOMB if one is standing to the north and looking south. So you're not really suggesting are you, this matters very much. Well, are you or aren't you and why? Uh, well, no, I, I think it, it matters and it matters locally. Um, I mean, uh, uh, clearly, uh, as was said earlier on in the appellant's opening, um, the, the overall setting of the OMB covers a wide area and no one development is going to significantly affect all of the setting. That just wouldn't be possible. Uh, so you're really only talking about localised effects on parts of the setting uh, and the effects on this part of the setting uh, would, in my view, be locally significant. Um, and it, it's not possible to get the same sorts of views that you get from Windmill Hill in lots of other places. Uh, you can do from slightly further to the east along Windmill Hill, but there aren't that many other areas of elevated ground looking over uh, attractive and largely undeveloped middle ground to the AOMB. Uh, once you're down on lower level, you don't get the same sorts of view because other things tend to... Uh, interfere with the foreground of the view to a greater level. But in terms of the views from within the site to the OMB, they, they have a different character, uh, uh, and you don't see the, uh, the you tend to see uh, vegetation in the middle ground obscuring the middle part of the view, and then the hills on the skyline above them. Uh, but from within the site, those views would again be significantly affected by the development because most of them will be blocked by new houses. And where some views remain between the houses, the character of the view would clearly be totally changed because you wouldn't be looking at the AOMB above a green field. You'd be looking at it between houses. Yeah. So to paraphrase, uh, in response to my suggestion that there are lots of perfectly good views towards the AONB, um, you would say this, I think, um, or you have said this, uh, no, Mr. Leader, actually, that's a rather glib point of view because Windmill Hill being elevated gives you a particularly advantageous opportunity to view the AONB. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yes, that's what can I'm you, saying. Uh, I, I... Can you sort of allow Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Etchells to sort of answer, answer the question rather than telling him what the answer is? That's a very fair point. So I, was, I, I thought I was getting around that difficulty <clears throat> by saying I thought I was summarising, but plainly I went too far. Perhaps I shouldn't have suggested the answer. Perhaps I should just put the question. So on that point, Mr. Etchells, ignore the latter part of my question. Just give your own answer. There, 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 are, there are other viewpoints uh, within uh, the area to the north of the AOMB that afford views of it. And I, I wouldn't say, and it would be silly to say, that these are the only views and therefore the setting is entirely compromised. Uh, but this part of the setting would be compromised, and this part of the setting does afford uh, very good opportunities to view the OMB from the top of Windmill Hill. Thank you very much. Well, sir, on that note, that concludes my examination in chief. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think... We'll take a short comfort break, if that's okay. Uh, let, let Mr. Etchells catch his breath. And then when we come back, um, Mr. Garvey will be able to cross-examine Mr. Mr. Etchells. Okay, so um, 15 minutes? Yep. Okay, so we'll come back at quarter past three.
inquiry is resumed. Um, so just to say, I've, I've received uh, Mr. Farmer's uh, qualifications via email over the break. So again, another, another document to be added to the uh, inquiry documents list. Um, so um, we're on to um, examination in chief of Mr. Mr. Etchells. So Mr. Garvey, you may now cross-examine cross um, Mr. Etchells, please. Thank you, sir. Just before I do, are you content for us to send in acquired documents that we've canvassed with you through to the case officer? Or yes. Um, in that case, I'll begin. Um, Mr. Etchell, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, first question. Um, as I understand it, there's no methodological criticism of the LVIA. We agree that in the Statement of Common Ground. Uh, yes, yes, sir. I, I had no real comments on the methodology, but as you've heard, I, I did have some comments on the findings. Yeah. Um, would I be right in saying you haven't done your own LVIA? No. Um, but ultimately, where there are differences of opinion, given that it's not a difference in methodology, ultimately, they're uh, different... different uh, sorry, diff sorry, just to clarify my previous answer, when you said, would I be right, my answer was, no, you would, be, you would not be right. I have done my own LVIA. It's in my proof. Right, so the, the proof gives the foundations of the LVIA rather than a specific LVIA. Well, my, my You've proof, done the exercise. My proof of evidence contains my own landscape and visual impact assessment. I understand. Um, where there are differences of opinion in this case, ultimately they come down to differences of professional judgment. That's right, isn't it? Uh, yes, they do. Um, although, as I went through with Mr. Leader, it, it would appear that in terms of uh, things like sensitivity, there is a difference not only between myself and Mr. Cook, but between various other people and Mr. Cook as well. But, yeah. but yes, they, 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 where there are differences, I don't think it's because uh, the wrong process has been gone through. I think it's the wrong, in my view, the wrong judgments have been made as part of that process. Yeah, I understand. Um, the site is not subject to any landscape designations. We agree with that. Uh, we do, yes. And we also agree that it, the site doesn't qualify to be constituted as a valued landscape per paragraph 174C of the framework. Yes, that, that is my view. I say that in my evidence is in the Statement of Common Ground, uh, yes. Yeah, and what you did is you did the, the box 5.1 exercise, i.e. What's, what's identified in Glivia as the qualities that you look at. You did that exercise and ultimately you concluded that the site was not of sufficient quality in itself to constitute a valued landscape. No, I didn't do that because my view about what constitutes a valued landscape is uh, in terms of the words used in paragraph 174, which says uh, valued landscapes because of their statutory status or identified quality in the development plan. Clearly the site has no statutory status. It's not an AOMB or national park. And in landscape terms, although it's clearly a concept, part of it is in the conservation area, it doesn't have an identified landscape quality in the development plan. So my interpretation of paragraph 174 is it needs to be either one or the other of those to be a valued landscape in those terms. Uh, there's then a separate exercise of assessing the value of the landscape, which is the box 5.1 exercise uh, as also uh, clarified and qualified by the recent technical guidance note, which the Landscape Institute came up with about assessing landscape value outside designated areas, which I also refer to in my evidence. Right, but having done that exercise, you thought it didn't qualify as a valued landscape? Uh, no. <laughs> to, repeat, to repeat what I just said, my way of assessing whether it's a valued landscape or not is to look at the words in paragraph 174. And if it doesn't have a statutory status or identified quality, it's not a valued landscape. That doesn't mean it can't still be of higher landscape value, which was the assessment I then came to by adopting the box 5.1 approach. I understand. Well, given that there's no um, landscape designation and it doesn't qualify as a valued landscape, the, the value that it has is, again, purely a question of judgment. Uh, yes, yes. I mean, like I said, my, my, my view of my approach to whether it is a, or is not a valued landscape in paragraph 174 terms, it isn't really judgment because if it has a statutory status or identified quality, in my view, it then is a valued landscape. But if you're just assessing landscape value, 
then uh, same as if you're assessing landscape quality or landscape effects, there is a judgment to be made. Yeah. Um, let's talk about uh, the setting of the AOMB. Um, the AOMB itself, if we turn up the AOMB management plan, which you'll find at core document E6. Um, I have an extract from it. I don't have the core document in front of me, but it depends what part of it you're going to. Well, we're, we're going to page 10 uh, in, within the document. Yep, now I have page 10. And it says the statement of significance, the AOMB special qualities. Can you see that? I can. And it says that rising from the sunset levels are the distinctive Mendip Hills um, that with the lakes of Chew Valley and Blagden form the 198 square kilometers that is the Mendip Hills AOMB. Yep. Yeah, so just as a starting point, the AOMB itself is a vast area, you'd agree? Uh, it, yeah, um, yeah. No, it's 198 square kilometers. Yeah, yeah. And its setting, tell me if you agree with this, the setting of the AMB is anywhere where you can appreciate the AMB, i.e. there's some element of intervisibility. Would you agree with that? Um, no, I think, I, I, well, the setting in terms of the setting which could be affected and is worth considering, I, I would say is rather smaller than that. I'm not sure that you're really in the setting of the AMB if you can see the hills from 10 miles away, uh, because clearly anything that happened in that location wouldn't really be affecting the setting. So I think the setting is, is I mean, it, it, there's no strict definition of it, uh, but I think it might be more functional. The setting would be the area within which any changes may actually affect the AOMB. So I think it, it, it's not just any degree of intervisibility. Um, just turn up your proof, please. And we're going to paragraph 6.2.8 on page 38, please. You got that? I do, yes. Thank you. Um, you say that there's no set methodology for assessing, assessing effects in the setting of an AOMB, but it's largely a visual matter. Um, and you say that you identified some generally low-level visual effects of views from within the AMB towards the site and higher-level effects on views towards the AMB from within the site and across the site from Windmill Hill. There is also the point that the overall setting of the AMB covers a very large area, and these effects would be on small parts of the setting only. Just that very large area, you're saying, well, it's not 10 kilometers. For argument's sake, we don't need to define it, but we agree it would extend much further beyond the AOMB. Uh, yes, yes, uh, it, and it really, if you're talking about a, a development which could potentially have an effect on the setting of the AOMB, it would clearly depend on the nature of the development. If it was a wind farm, it could have an effect on the setting of the AOMB, even if it was several kilometers beyond it. So yes, I, I, I agree with you that, that the AOMB is a large area, therefore its setting is also a large area, but the precise distance out from the AOMB boundary depends on a number of factors and you can't really put a, a, a number on it. Yeah, fair enough. Um, a few points that I think we, um, that there wasn't too much between us. National character area, I think you do this in your appendices. If we could just turn up your appendices, please. Um, and if we go to the tables that you've helpfully put, uh, behind Appendix C, if you wouldn't mind. At pages 34. Yeah. You with me, yeah? I am, yeah. In terms of uh, impact on the national character area, you, you say that it's negligible. Um, and in terms of the more local character area, you say that it's slight adverse at year 15. Yes, it's largely a degree of scale, I think. If you, if you take an individual development, which is what we've got here, and you judge it against a progressively wider area, the effects of that development on the wider area will be progressively lower yeah. uh, because it's the same amount of disturbance going into a bigger area. I understand. That's uh, the character areas. In terms of the AOMB, at the end of your evidence in chief, you said that the views from, from the site sorry, from the AOMB looking towards the site, you said that the um, impact would be negligible 
I understood that correctly, didn't I? Uh, yes. Yeah, negligible by definition means not material. Uh, yes, I mean, yeah, well, it's, yeah. Not, uh, uh, it's not insignificant, but, but yes, I mean, it, they would be at a very low level. Yeah, well, if we're talking about it being negligible, i.e. not material, the planning system concerns itself with material impacts, not non-material ones. So if it is negligible, as you say, ultimately it's an impact that we need not concern ourselves with. Um, well, uh, that's really for the inspector to decide, I think. Uh, uh, my view would be that any impact on the AOMB needs to be considered rather than not considered, but it, this impact is at a very low level. Well, I understood that you were amending your evidence to suggest that it's no, no longer a low level, it's negligible, which, at, which would be of, of, of such an impact, it's of no consequence, it's insignificant. Uh, well, I'm asking about the answer he gave in evidence in chief where he said it was negligible, which he agreed, that's what he said. Uh, well, the, the, uh, I, I do set this out further on in my table two, summary of visual effects, where I do say, and this is on page 37, that the magnitude of change to the view would be negligible, resulting in insignificant visual effects for users of routes within the AOMB. Right, okay. Um, in terms of why you said that is because ultimately you're seeing rooftops on a site that currently can barely be seen, if at all seen currently. Uh, well, uh, I don't think we need to, to argue really about whether it can be seen or not. I've included some photographs in which you can see the church tower, some of them you can see the site next to it and the inspector will be able to see for himself. Um, but no, the reason I say that the effects would be insignificant is because they're elevated views from some distance away. They're very wide, expansive views. You can see the existing village and the development would, in those views, be a, a small incremental addition to the settlement and in most of them you would just see a few roofs. Right. Okay, um, and then you distinguish that from views from the site towards the A&B. Yes. Um, and you say that in terms of what that overall impact is, you say that it would be uh, in, I'm going to your appendices again, you say that at year one it's limited, but at year 15 the effects would decline over time. So presumably by year 15 it's less than limited. Well, what I say in, in that column, effects in year one, is limited effects on the overall setting of the OMB, which, don't, which extends over a very wide area. Mm -hmm. And I go on to say, however, there would be significant effects on the setting in the area around the site. And the difficulty is, as, I, as we said just now, that, that there is no set methodology for, effects, for assessing the effects on the setting of an AOMB. And, and the, over, the overall setting is obviously very large, so you're going to struggle to have any effects on that, any significant effects on that, unless the development is very extensive. But if you look at specific aspects of the setting, uh, my view is that the overall effects would be limited in year one, but the effects on the setting ex as experienced from the area around the site would be significant. Right, but the conclusion that the inspector is invited to take from your evidence, as I understand it, is that overall the effect on the AOMB setting is low level, but at year one, and then slightly lower level, or some degree of lower well, well, at year 15, is that right? Yes, that's on the overall setting, uh, and it's back to the question about, that we spoke about with the national character. It's, it's partly a question of scale. That this is, this is a, a medium-sized housing development. It can't really have a significant effect on the overall setting of the AOMB because from most parts of the overall setting you can't see it. Um, but what I do say for effects in year 15, I do say effects would decline over time, but the principal effects of the presence of the development in views towards the AOMB from Windmill Hill and from within the site would persist. Right. Um, I think there's a, well actually you can tell me, do you agree with um, what I said in opening that the protection afforded to the AMB is from views 
from the OMB out. It's not views towards the OMB. No. You disagree with the Stroud judgment? Uh, well, I, I've got no issue with the Stroud judgment, which was a judgment about that particular case and how at that time paragraph 115 of the NPPF should be interpreted. But as I set out in my evidence, uh, and I don't know if you've still got it open, sir, but, but uh, we were looking at page 10 of the AOMB management plan just now. And page 10 of the AOMB management plan, just underneath the section I was taken to, does say that one of the special qualities of the Mendip Hills AOMB is views towards the Mendip Hills and the distinctive hill line. So irrespective of the Stroud judgment, the AOMB management plan identifies views towards the AOMB, not from the AOMB, as one of its special qualities. Okay. Um it, it might be a, sp a special quality, but in terms of the protection afforded to the AMB in national policy, and I ask you about this because you address it in your proof of evidence, um, if we were to afford the same protection to both views out of the AMB as we did views into the AMB, it would substantially extend the protection to the AMB. That's right, isn't it? Uh, well, it, it would depend on, on the individual nature of the view and on what the development proposal was. But the principle of protecting views towards the hills is clearly set out as one of the special qualities of the AMB. So that, that can't be disregarded. Um, and in the planning practice guidance, which I do also refer to in, if I can find it, uh, in my paragraph 4210, so this isn't the MPPF, but it's a, the accompanying planning practice guidance, which uh, is talking, uh, and that's the, I'll give the reference there, it's talking specifically about development within the setting of AONBs, and it says, land within the setting of these areas often makes an important contribution. This is especially the case where long views from or to the designated landscape are identified as important. And the AOMB management plan clearly identifies the views to the hills as important because it says they're one of the special qualities. So it seems very clear to me that, that regardless of what the strange judgment may have said at the time, that views towards amended hills are important and do need to be taken into account. I think we're speaking at cross purposes. Firstly, the reference to the PPG, where are you taking me to there? Sorry. Sorry, I didn't the you. reference to the planning practice guidance. Where in the planning practice guidance are you referring me to, please? Uh, well, in my 4.2.10, I give the uh, reference to it. Paragraph 0.4.2, I mean, the, the PPG references are somewhat strange because it's all online. I, I ask because I couldn't find that reference in the planning practice guidance. I'm not saying it's not there, but I couldn't find it. So I'm asking you, what are you referring us to? Uh, well, well th that, that was the online version I looked at, and that's where it says it. I mean, I can't call it up now because I don't have it to hand. I don't have a computer, but um, that, that's what it says. Okay, well, um, if, if there is something in the PPG you're going to refer to, you're going to have to show us. I'm not saying it's not there, but I couldn't find it. So if, there, if that does exist, I'm going to ask you, and it, uh, might be, it might be we have to recall you to ask questions about it. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 well, I didn't make it up. I looked at it online when I was writing this, and... I, I copied it and pasted it into the document. Okay. Setting aside the PPG, what's said, the, the point that was uh, why in the Stroud judgment, they said, well, we aren't going to extend the policy protection to views towards the AMB is because the court said, well, that will give very wide protection to land outside the AMB and not significant in views from the AMB. And the court said, well, that would extend it far too much out. And, and in the Example, they thought that in that case, uh, it would cover almost the entirety of the Stroud district. So, As I read the core documents, I didn't see the Stroud judgment identified. Is it in there? No, we agreed we weren't going to put judgments well, in that, the well, well, there are judgments in there. For a start, there's Hallam Land. But the only point I'm, I wanted to raise is I'm absolutely fine to talk to Mr. Etchells about the Stroud judgment, but this morning you gave us a paragraph. And if we're going to go beyond that, I think in fairness, Mr. Eshels needs to be able to read 
whatever parts you say are going to be relevant so that he can answer the questions in an informed way. Um, I've got no problem with the questions, but he just needs to have a chance to deal with the material. Of course, it's, I'm reading from my opening submissions. Um, I think if we are going to talk in detail about the judgment, it needs to be before the inquiry. Uh, of course, so. Well, it, 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 I'll, I'll put it in the judgment. I think we said at the CMC we'll put judgments in as and when they're needed. Um, but very well. I have no difficulty with that. And then the second question um, then arises is whether Mr. Etchells considers himself familiar enough to, to answer questions on it without having had the opportunity to, to review it. Well, it, it depends where the questions are going to go. But if the principle is the strategy judgment saying that it would be a bit silly to automatically include anywhere within the setting as potentially effective where you can see the AOMB from, I would agree with that, that, that and I think we said that just now, that, that I don't think you'd want to include in the setting any land that had some view of the Mendips because it would be a very large area. Uh, but where I think we differ is I don't think you can then interpret that as saying that you don't need to take any account whatsoever of views to it because, as we've just discussed, views to the Mendip Hills are, are noted as being one of the special qualities of the AOMB. Well, in that case, I think that's very helpful because I don't think we're, we're actually apart. It's, it's, my question was you don't afford it the same protection as you would it being within the AMB, but I'm not saying that it's not a material consideration that you ignore. Well, you, you, would you agree with that? You, you clearly don't afford land outside the AMB the same protection as land within it. Uh, but I think you do afford a similar level of protection in this case because of what the... Uh, management plan says, I think you do afford similar protection to views towards and views from the AOMB. And that's also what policy DM11 of the local plan says. It talks about views into and out of. Okay. I think it's a policy point, so we'll probably put that the limit of what I can, I can ask a, a landscape witness. Um, in terms of the experience of anyone walking down the public right-of-way of Mendip Hill, um, the inspector will obviously have, obviously have gone there, but just to see if you agree some of these points. When you're walking down the public right-of-way towards the site, you will at first see housing in Churchill before you see the site. Do you agree with that? Uh, are you talking about Windmill Hill? Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, quite right. <laughs> I think you said Mendip. But, uh, so, sorry, can you answer the question again? Yeah, when you're walking... Uh, down Windmill Hill towards the site. Yep. Um, because of the the plateau of that hill, yep. you will at first see Churchill, i.e., you will see housing prior to you seeing the site. Do you agree with that? Yes. If you're walking to the south, it's a domed hill. So when you're on the top of the dome, the site is over the ridge. Mm. So you don't see the surface of the site, but progressively you will see. First of all, some houses within the village, and then as you go down the slope, you'll see the site as it appears below you. But what I would say is that you don't see the houses in the village that clearly, because as in the photographs I looked at with Mr. Leader, the, the houses along Front Street are, are reasonably well separated from the site by intervening vegetation and uh, some small paddocks. Yeah, but when you go over that plateau, you expect to see development currently, don't you? Because you go over and you see Churchill. Uh, well, as you go over the, the crest of the ridge, you do see some houses within the village, but you don't expect to see any further development just because you can see that. At the moment, you expect to see the green fields of the site because that's what you're used to seeing. Um, so when you actually would be seeing the site, uh, and seeing, assuming housing was put in the site, you would be seeing the housing in the context of the existing development and settlement around it already? Because you've already seen Churchill before you've seen the site. Uh, well, you, 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 yes, you would be seeing the, if the development proceeds, you would be seeing the development on the site in the context of, in the same view and previously higher up the hill, being able to see some of the houses within the village. But 
the views of those other houses within the village are at least partially filtered by intervening vegetation. And in contrast, the views you would have of the development on the site when it comes into view would be much more direct and much more open and also of a much larger scale of development. So there would be a clear difference. Okay. Um, the next point, you made a point about what are the characteristics of the site. Um, and you were saying that it's rural, and you obviously heard Mr. Cook in his proof of evidence. He had written that it was peri-urban, and I think he took um, umbrage with his use of the word urban. Uh, well, he said urban fringe as well, and I took umbrage with that as well. Just, if I ask you to turn up your appendices, please. Um, and I, I, as I understand it, your point was, well, it can't be urban, because this is a village, and necessarily you can't have an urban fringe in a village, as I understood it. Well, well, it's two points, really. One is the term urban is normally used in terms of larger urban, larger settlements. Um, and the other is that urban fringe does have sort of negative connotations. But I, I understood you took particular on bridge with his use of the word um, urban to suggest, well, it can't be urban because we're in a village. Did I misunderstood that? In the context of saying it's urban fringe or peri-urban, in the context he was using it, yes. You, in your appendices at page 37, please... Have you got that? Uh, I do. Um, in your use of the public right of way, the second sensitivity, you see high for users of the footpath, AX14, over Windmill Hill. And in terms of the magnitude of change, you describe it as being high because you say the development would urbanize and completely change the character of these views. Yes. Well, you are yourself acknowledging that there would be an urban influence on the site. I'm just, I'm struggling with your taking umbrage with Mr. Cook's use of the word it, that the, set, the village would have a, a peri-urban feel while you say that this development would urbanise itself. Well, we're, we're talking about two different things. Mr. Cook is talking about the village in its present form, which I don't think is urban. But once it's had 62 houses and a housing estate added to it, I think it, even if it's still a village and it's not totally urban, it would clearly, in my view, be more urbanised than it is at the moment. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying the view is urban at the moment, I'm saying the development would urbanise the view. I understand. Whilst we are looking um, here, in the preceding page in your appendices, page 36, you list a number of visual receptors. And can you see that you use the properties to the west, to the south, prop distant properties? Can you see that? Yes. And then in your sensitivity, you're saying that these are views that are mainly from upper floor windows for five properties, properties to the south, it's three properties on the north. Do you see that? I do. Can I ask you to turn up the statement to common ground, please? Um, and then in page 11, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, yes. Uh, second bullet point, it's agreed that the proposal will lead to some visual landscape harm. The extent of that harm is not agreed. The proposal will not materially cause any harm to residential amenity, which cannot be resolved through conditions of reserve matters. Can you see that? I can. So in, in so far as you reference views from properties Ultimately, we agree that they will not materially harm those views. Uh, no. Um, my understanding of the term residential amenity is where the development becomes so obtrusive and perhaps overshadowing that it actually affects the amenity of living in the house. I don't think that's the same as saying that there can't be adverse visual effects on people who live in the house in terms of their view. Well, you, so you wouldn't agree that if... So amenity isn't in any way associated with the view from upper windows? Well, no, it is. Residential, it, adverse effects on residential amenity, in my view, is, is when visual effects or other effects in terms of noise or whatever become so severe that they affect the ability to enjoy living in the property. So you could have visual effects which affected 
residential amenity if there was an enormous development very close to a house. But that, that's my understanding of residential amenity. Uh, my interpretation of what it says there uh, in the Statement of Common Ground is not that there could be no adverse effects on views from houses, because clearly there would be. Some houses have views across the site, which at the moment are pleasant rural views, and they'll be replaced by views of a housing estate. So clearly there'd be some harm to the view, but not to the degree that residential amenity would be harmed. Yeah so, yeah, so ultimately, to the extent of which there would be an adverse visual effect, it's not going to prevent, it's not going to materially alter your enjoyment of your home? Well, uh, I think some people would, well, most people would probably prefer not to be looking at the houses, and they probably prefer to retain their uh, existing rural view. Well, I'm struggling with that. Then, then it either does affect their residential amenity, which, as you characterised it, is someone's ability to enjoy their home, or it doesn't. If we agree that it doesn't materially change the ability to, of someone to enjoy their home, it might necessarily mean that any landscape effect on these homes is not so material. Um, well, my assessment is that there would be uh, adverse visual effects to some of these properties as set out in this table. Uh, it's also that those effects wouldn't be so severe that they would affect the residential amenity of the property in, in terms of being able to enjoy living there. Okay. In terms, of, in terms of the habitability of the house. Okay. Um, well, I understand your answer. Um, the next point I wanted to ask you about is this notion of peri-urban or, or what not. Uh, ultimately, the inspector will form his own view on these sorts of matters, so I don't want to labour them, but it's correct, isn't it, that when you're seeing the site from Windmill Hill, you are seeing a site that effectively has development on three sides, aren't you? Um, no. Uh, I can see that there, there is to some degree uh, visibility of development to the south of the site, and there is to some degree visib visibility of development to the west of the site in terms of the school. I'm not sure where you get the third side from. Right, so when you're looking down views to the left, you're saying, well, you're, you're not seeing development in the, in the distance. Uh, well, I suppose you're looking, in that case, to the southwest, but the, sorry, southeast. But from Windmill Hill, you can see development of the south of the site along Front Street, although, as I've said, those are fairly well-spaced detached houses and they're fairly well-screened, so it's not very prominent or, or dense or intrusive development. You're also aware of the school buildings to the west of the site, uh, but to the east of the site, there is no development. To the southeast, there is, but it's just a continuation of what there is to the south of the site. Okay, I understand. The next point I want to ask you about is um, something that you said in Evidence in Chief. I want to make sure I understood it correctly. You said that the most important views um, were views photographs one and five. Did I understand that correctly? No, I didn't say they were the most important views. I, I was really, Mr. Leader asked me to show some photographs which sort of summarise some of the issues and some of the views. Um, I haven't really tried to categorise the views in terms of importance. They, they were ones I went to to try and give some summary idea of, of what the site looked like and what the views across it were. Right, I understand. Um, next point for you, if you wouldn't mind, veteran trees. Now, as I understand it, we agree that the root protection areas of the veteran trees won't in any way be affected. Uh, yes, I think that's the way the development has been designed, so that the trees would be physically unharmed. Yeah, so there is no loss or deterioration to the veteran trees themselves. Correct. I think your point is that as local landscape features, putting housing around them will in some way harm them. Is that right? Uh, it, it would remove a large part of their contribution to existing landscape character. I understand. Because the standing advice, as I do say, does refer to indirect effects on ancient woodlands and or veteran trees, and, and it does say that there can be indirect effects in terms of landscape character. Yeah, but that 
that advice from the planning practice guidance is how indirect effects can affect their loss or deterioration. Ultimately, that's what the protection is to a veteran tree. It's trying to ensure that the veteran tree itself is not harmed. Uh, no, I think what it's saying is it's trying to say that you shouldn't, uh, or, or it can be a consideration if the veteran tree's contribution to landscape character is harmed by a development. I understand. That, that's my interpretation of what it says. I understand. Well, it's, I think it's a, an interpretation point. Um, in terms of the ability to appreciate the veteran trees, currently one of the formal public rights of way goes near one of the veteran trees, but the other veteran tree one wouldn't be able to access. That's right, isn't it? Um, well, the, the, the diagonal public right of way, when it wasn't unofficially diverted, did run quite close to the sycamore. Yeah. Uh, the oak tree isn't near a right of way, but it is quite close to uh, Church Lane and can be seen quite clearly through the field gate of Church Lane. So. You are quite aware of both of the trees, and you can appreciate them quite well from public rights away and public roads. Yeah, but in terms of how, in how one can appreciate them, it's only at a distance for the veteran oak, and you can go near the veteran sycamore as things stand right now. Uh, yes, as things stand, the, uh, if, you, if you look, sir, at my figure two, it's got the public rights away superimposed on the aerial photograph. So you can see that the diagonal right of way, if it was on its official route still, would go right next to the sycamore tree. But the oak tree isn't next to a right of way, but it is fairly close to Church Lane. So, yes. Yeah. Um, but obviously, if planning permission was granted, it w there would be an opportunity, wouldn't there, to actually make a feature of these veteran trees and create a designed uh, area of green infrastructure around them so that people actually could go near them, enjoy them, and see them up close. <coughs> Uh, yes, uh, as shown on the, the layout plan, the, 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 a feature is made of the two trees and there's a sort of circular area of open space around each of them. Uh, so you would be able to physically get closer to them without trespassing. Uh, although, you, as I just said, you can get quite close to the sycamore already. Uh, so that is true and I agree with you, but that is at the cost, uh, and in my view that, that's quite a significant cost, of the trees losing almost all of their value as landscape features because they wouldn't be uh, veteran trees within an open green area and you wouldn't be able to see them from a distance in the same way. You'd be able to get closer to them but you would be experiencing them as trees, within, remnant trees within a housing estate. Uh, you wouldn't experience them in at all the same way. So while there would be a greater ability to access them, I don't, regree, I don't regard that as, as in any way any kind of net benefit. Okay. Um, the, in terms of the footpaths, you say in your proof of evidence that the public rights of way, I'm talking about the public rights of way that actually go through the site, you described them in your proof of evidence as being well used. Now, of course, the formal public rights of way that cuts across the site, that's not well used, is it? Uh, well, it's not used at all because it's been blocked uh, by uh, the landowner. Yeah. So you can't use it. Yeah. Um, now, the, the reality is, in terms of the value ascribed to views from that public right of way, we're not aware of anyone who's complained about that public right of way having been unofficially diverted. Are you? Uh, I, I don't know. I probably wouldn't know because the complaints wouldn't come to me. Uh, what I do know is that because uh, the council asked their uh, rights away officer and he said that he didn't know of any uh, request to divert it. So the diversion is unofficial uh, and I'm not a lawyer, but I think probably illegal. Um, uh, but no, I'm not aware of any complaints. Um, and I say they're well used because I have observed people uh, walking around the diverted route around the edge of the field and there's a marked track. Yeah, so at the moment, the, the diagonal public right way that cuts across the site, no one is currently enjoying it. And as we're aware, no one's crying out, saying um, that we're, we've lost this, these valuable views from that diagonal public right of way. I, I can't answer whether there have or haven't been any complaints, and I can't really answer whether anyone is using the diagonal route. I mean, you, you could do if you wanted to climb over the fences and you would have the right to because it's a right of way. Correct, but in, it, 
there's no evidence that people are doing that, is there? Because ultimately there, there would be some something on the ground that you, would suggest you, people yeah, are walking it. You'd have to be able to jump an electric fence, which is probably not a great idea anyway. So. Yeah. Um, so in terms of how we value the specific views from that public right of way that cuts across the side, ultimately, does it in any way diminish the value you attach to them when you factor in that people aren't currently enjoying them and as far as we're aware, no one's crying out about the loss of these views? Uh, well, no, I don't think it does because that is still an official public right of way and has been for a very long period of time and it, it is a long-standing official public right of way. And I think the fact that somebody has unofficially diverted it temporarily doesn't diminish its value. But even if we were to take the view that it had been officially diverted and the route ran around the edge of the field, you would still be talking about and assessing significant adverse effects on the right of way going around, it, around the edge of the field. It, it's not really the route which creates the value. It, it's the ability to access the site and walk along right of way through the countryside and enjoy the views that you can. I understand. Um, you acknowledge a distinction, don't you, in your proof of evidence between landscape and visual harm, and you recognise whilst there can be elements that feed into one another, they are distinct. That's right, isn't it? Uh, yes, I, I do say that. They, they are assessed separately, but they, they are related, yes. Yeah. And Mr Cook, he draws a distinction between, uh, when he's talking about landscape, between landscape elements and landscape character. And that's an appropriate approach to landscape character and elements, isn't it? Uh, it is, yes. It's what's normally done. I think it's recommended in the GLVAA, and it's what I've done as well. Uh, yeah. So landscape elements are things which could be physically affected, like trees or hedges or topography. Yeah. Uh, but in my view also, which Mr. Cook doesn't do, a la landscape elements of the site which can be physically affected are the open fields of the site itself. They are elements of the landscape. But that, so that's landscape elements of things which can be physically affected, and then you've got landscape character, which is more to do with the nature of it, and that's where more of an element of the appearance and how you appreciate it comes in. Yeah, and the landscape elements that would be affected are limited to the site itself? Yes, because the landscape elements have to be physically affected, so they, they are within the site, although this particular proposal does also include some highway works outside the site in terms of the speed table. Yeah. Um, Mr Cook's evidence is ultimately, in terms of landscape elements, there's going to be a net improvement to green infrastructure. And you heard Mr Farmer indicate that there is a, a, a benefit in terms of biodiversity net gain. You don't personally, I know that the council's ecologist might take a look, but you don't personally dispute that, do you? Uh, well, I, I, I don't express a view one way or the other about bio, biodiversity net gain because I'm not really qualified to. Um, in terms of the benefits to the landscape elements, as I understand it, Mr Cook's argument is that because there would be more length of hedgerow uh, after the development than at the moment, and because there'd be some new tree planting, there are benefits in terms of hedges and trees. Um, I would agree with that in terms of the trees, in terms of landscape elements, because there, there would be some new tree planting uh, and the veteran trees would be retained. So the tree resource in terms of numbers would increase on the site. I'm not sure I agree in terms of hedges because as I discussed with Mr. Leader, there would be a, a significant loss of existing hedgerows to the tune of over 200 meters. Uh, although some of those would be translocated, so I suppose in the longer term there might be a net increase in terms of the length of hedgerows, but, so, but that's only in terms of landscape features. So there might be more length of hedgerow, there might be more trees, uh, and so hedges and trees might be winners in the overall equation because there'd be more of them, but in terms of the overall effects of the scheme, it's not, in my view, any kind of net benefit because the extra trees and hedges come at the expense of also having 62 houses spread across the site. Yeah, but that's, that's where the landscape character comes into it, isn't it? In terms of landscape elements, which you agreed we can distinguish, the landscape elements, Mr Cook's right, that there will be a net improvement to elements. Because uh, well, you've said uh, we've got winners with trees and hedges. It, it, it could be argued that there would be an improvement in the narrow terms of there being more trees and greater lengths of hedges. But uh, as I just said, 
in my view, if you're talking about landscape elements, you also need to include the fields which make up the site, which are elements of the local landscape, and those fields would be completely and irrevocably lost. So they would be net losers in the overall equation. Well, in terms of the fact that there would be, there would be less in terms of geographical space, but there's an opportunity to improve the quality of the landscape elements in terms of green infrastructure. You've seen in the master planning, there's still a lot of green infrastructure across the site, and ultimately that leads to a net gain in environmental terms through the biodiversity net gain. Uh, well, uh, as I said, I can't really comment on biodiversity, but there would, be, there, would, there would or could be a net gain in terms of numbers of trees, lengths of hedgerows, and areas of semi-natural open space, areas of grassland and things like that. But there would also be a significant net loss in terms of the loss of the fields. And that is only landscape elements. We then go on to landscape character, where my view is that there'd be significant adverse effects. Landscape elements is only one part of it. Um, I was going to go into the translocation and, our, and whatnot, but I think you've agreed ultimately there's the opportunity for, in your words, a winner for hedges. So I don't think we actually are part in that. Is that fair? Um, well, I, I, I don't think Mr. Cook sets out the precise methodology uh, of how the translocation would be done. He, he, he uh, I think, gives some broad outline of it, but the, the precise methodology, I think, would be left to a condition. But one of the things I would say about translocation is it does rely on quite a high standard of aftercare because you're effectively trying to transplant semi-mature semi hedge plants. Uh, and if you get a hot, dry early spring and summer, they need a huge amount of watering, otherwise they'll all just die. Um, but assuming that they, they, it could work, uh, the, the, uh, the opportunity for benefits in terms of the length of hedges, I think, would be in the, the much longer term because it would take a long time for them to become established and become meaningful hedges in their own rights. And as I pointed out to Mr. Leader, Mr. Cook's own photographs show the translocated hedge after two years and it, and it still looks nothing like a hedge. It looks like uh, some rather unfortunate looking widely spaced plants. I'm sorry, I was, I was trying to curtail it, but I, I understood from your evidence in chief, you were saying whether you translocate or whether you just put new hedging in, I understood you were saying actually it's almost preferable to do the new hedging because as a landscape element, it's, it's, there's no real difference. I think it would be easier to get a hedge of a certain height in a shorter period of time if you planted it. The translocated ones may have biodiversity benefits because you're translocating the soil and the, uh, the herbage vegetation around the hedge as well as the actual hedge plants. But either way, what you'd get certainly in the first five years, probably in the, uh, in the first ten years, is you, you wouldn't have an effective hedge as a screen. You'd have nothing like what's there at the moment, uh, and you would have open views into the site along round about half of the present boundary. So there'd be no screening of the site. I understand. The next point I want to talk about is um, your paragraph 8.6, if you wouldn't mind, please. Tell me when you've got that. Uh, I have it, yes. Thank you. Um, so it's page 48, and what you say that you've ass assessed the site and immediately surrounding area as of high landscape quality and high value and high sensitivity development of the type proposed as L has a low ability to accommodate change because such change would lead to some loss of valuable features or elements, chiefly the open land of the site itself and the views of and across that open land. Um, you make a point similarly in your appendices uh, about the site being open land. Perhaps if we just turn up your appendices, if you wouldn't mind, please. Um, and it's page 35, if you would, please. Uh, yes. In effects in year 15... The second paragraph, you say that the present development within the presently open area would not be mitigated by the planting, especially given the elevated nature of some of the views across the site. The houses may become less visible over time in some views, but they would still be there and the open land would still have been lost. 
ultimately, these are points which would, could be made about any greenfield site, aren't they? And ultimately, you've got an open greenfield site. Um, yes, uh, any greenfield site, uh, if it's developed for housing, the open land would uh, still be lost in the longer term. But the, the nature and significance of those effects will vary significantly with uh, the quality, character, and sensitivity of the open land which you're losing. Um, if the open land you're using, losing is a not particularly pleasant, degraded uh, area of uh, perhaps not actively used farmland on the edge of a, an urban area and is in the, in the normal sense of the word urban fringe, then the fact that you've lost that open land would be less significant. But because the open land you've lost here is of much higher quality and sensitivity uh, and is at the moment you know, it helps to form uh, an attractive rural setting to the village and the conservation area, the fact that that has been lost permanently would be a more significant long-term effect. But in terms of the, the reasons why you say in your proof of evidence that this site it, it in particular is going to struggle to accommodate change is because it's open land and the views across it, would I be right in saying that what we're really talking about is it's a greenfield site and the views from Windmill Hill? They are the two things that really you're saying are the problem here. Uh, well, in terms of the things which make the site valuable and not, in my view, suitable for this development, are, are it is open, the views from Windmill Hill, the fact there's two footpaths going across it, the fact that the majority of it is within the conservation area, the fact that it affords attractive views of the village church across it, and it forms an attractive setting to the, the church, the village, and the conservation area. So it's all of those things. Just that point, um, conservation area, you, 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 you proof teases points about the conservation area and heritage assets. I presume I'm right in thinking all those questions are deferred to your heritage witness and aren't what, truly for you. Uh, it, it depends on the question. If it's a question about effects on heritage assets, then, then that's not my evidence and it's not part of my evidence. But the, uh, the presence of the conservation area and the views to the church uh, are part of the landscape value and nature and character of the site. Okay. And we spoke about box 5.1 of the GLVIA earlier, and that does include uh, factors such as uh, the presence of heritage assets and designations. Um, okay, I'm gonna pick up heritage assets um, with the heritage witness. In respect to the next point I want to talk to you about, if in your proof of evidence, if you wouldn't mind, please, you talk about the form of development in Churchill, and it's at paragraph 3.2.21. Uh, yes. Now you're talking about the character of the village, and you say that the village hasn't grown outwards from a center with a fairly dense, homogenous manner. Um, you say that the open land is an integral part of the character of the village. Filling in that open area with built development would fundamentally change its character and reduce its distinctiveness. I confess I, I was struggling to get my head around this, and I'm sure it's me, but w were you saying, well, ultimately, there is a, almost a, an eccentric, random way in which Churchill has grown out? Um, yes. Um, I think Ms. Hudson McCauley refers to it more specifically in her evidence in terms of the church formally being in the centre of the village and then that part of the settlement being abandoned. Uh, but yeah, I think it is eccentric and unusual in that you've got the village and then you've got the village church, which would more typically be in the middle of it, uh, separated out to one side and separated by effectively the land of the site. And, and that is an unusual arrangement, but, but, but the product of it is that you do get the uh, more open views of the church across the appeal site, whereas you wouldn't normally get that because the church would be within the village and surrounded by houses. Because the, the reason why I'm struggling with that is it, it, it's rather saying, well, the way in which this settlement has grown out is in an eccentric, random way. And the reason why your proposal offends against that is it comes into a logical location to put it. It's not consistent with this random eccentric pattern. Ultimately, this is where you would logically expect it, so it doesn't chime with that random sporadic 
eccentric. I, I, I'm not sure what you're saying uh, logically what would be found where. I, I'm not, not following your question, I'm afraid. The only way in which this development proposal could offend against this random eccentric way in which the settlement has grown out is if you're saying putting housing here isn't random or eccentric, it's perfectly logical. This is where you'd expect to put it rather than it being in the eccentric no, place. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that the, the village has grown as it has for whatever historic reason, but the net result of that is that you do get this open land between the village and the church which is part of its character, and it is an integral part of its character, and has been for some time, that you do get these open views to the church and from the church back to the village. And that is part of its existing character. Filling in the open land with built development would change that character. Uh, and I'm saying that in a way in which, if you had a more normal nucleated village, and the proposal was just to put another layer on the onion on the outside of it, that wouldn't be such a change because you'd just be incrementally growing outwards, whereas here you'd be filling in an open area which contributes to the character and setting of the village. Okay. Um, the next point I'd like to canvas with you is in your appendices. It's figure three, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, page six of your appendices, is it? Uh, be somewhere around there, yes. Have you got that? I have, yes. Thank you. So, as I understand what this pink line is, or purple line, is this is the area in which the effects of the site will principally be experienced? Yes. You'd agree, naturally, that that's a very localised area? Uh, yes, it is what it is. It's, it's a relatively small area, I say in my evidence. I think it's relatively tightly drawn around the site. Uh, it's contained by, effectively, the edge of the settlement and the higher ground of Windmill Hill. Yeah. And it's those views at, which are at close proximity, which are predominantly the views experienced on the site itself and from Windmill Hill, they are the areas where you predominantly say they're harm to... Um, landscape character and visual harm will be experienced? Uh, yes, on, on Windmill Hill, uh, the footpaths across the site, the footpaths as they approach the site, and parts of Front Street and Church Lane, yes. As I understand the parts of Front Street and Church Lane, that's the views that you can get through the gate? Uh, well, not just that. There is the view from the existing gate on Front Street. Uh, there are also the views from the existing accesses on Church Lane, but with the development in place, it would also be the views through the 200 odd metres of hedgerow which have been removed. Uh, and obviously, of course, the, the houses are somewhat taller than, or would be somewhat taller than the hedges. So you, even where the hedge is retained, uh, you'll see the houses above the hedge. So uh, in, the development would be visible from all of Church Lane, I think, within the area. and quite a lot of Front Street. I understand. Um, I'd like to talk to you about these two documents. Um, so the document you've put in today, and you said, well, this is, this is everybody else, and this is Mr. Cook on his lonesome, and I'd like to just examine whether that's accurate. So we're going to do that first by looking at this MHP document, if you wouldn't mind, please. This is the parish sensitivity assessment. Correct. Yeah. So you're going to have to answer some questions on it um, uh, uh, because it's a new document to us. So firstly, do you agree that this isn't a public document? Uh, I did check that with the council. Uh, as I understand it, this is a document commissioned by the parish uh, to assist with their developing neighbourhood plan. Uh, and the parish are here so they can say if I'm wrong, but isn't uh, something that's been publicly made available. Yeah. So uh, It was, however, referenced in the parish's comments on the application. There was a whole section about it which were made in September 2021. Yeah. Um, and similarly, if it's not a public document, necessarily there's been no consultation on it. Uh, no, there can't have been, no. Yeah. Um, you, you're quite right, it was produced to, to inform the neighbourhood plan. We see that at 1.1 on page 2. 
where it says the aim of this study is to assist decision making and inform the parish neighbourhood plan. Um, but obviously, as we heard earlier today, the neighbourhood plan is no longer being progressed. It's being, it's being on hold until the local plan is dealt with. Uh, I think that's what we said, yes. Yeah. Um, and we can also see at the back of the document, um, if you go to page, actually it's not page, it's figure eight, which is, if you count backwards, it's um, four figures from the back. Can you see that? Uh, not yet, but I'm getting there. Uh, yes. So figure uh, eight, can you see um, the areas CH1? Yep. Yeah, CH1, we've marked where the appeal site is. It's just there. Uh, yeah, I've done the same. Yeah, so CH1, you'd agree, necessarily covers a wide area, which includes uh, the school, it goes actually includes the A and B itself, and it's a much wider parcel of land than the site itself. Uh, yes, yes, that's what it shows. It, it, it includes part of the A and B in its sort of southeastern part. Yes. Yeah, and actually the conclusions on the site, um, which if you go internally, page sixteen. Are you with me? I am, yes. So you can see that this is the uh, assessment of site CH1. And if you go to page 18 in the conclusion, yep. you can see that it says that the land unit is rated as high sensitivity due to it containing nationally protected landscapes. We're well, just pausing there. That's obviously a reference to the A and B. It must be, yes. Yeah, which obviously doesn't include the site itself, the appeal nope. site and heritage assets. It contains community-valued recreational facilities, which, um, well, that's talking about the sports facilities and the village hall. Yeah? Uh, I assume so, yes. Um, and the distinctive natural landform with numerous public footpaths networks. It is also instrumental in providing separation and separate identities between the settlement areas of Churchill, Churchill Gate, Old Churchill, and Langford. But obviously, there's no suggestion that the development of this appeal site would in any way cause any difficulty with the separate identities of those different settlement areas, is there? Uh, no, um, but that is the conclusion. Um, but it, it, it does rate the whole area as high sensitivity, not just a bit within the AOMB. And if we go back to page 17, it does talk about things which do relate to the site such as the valuable and key views from all directions from Windmill Hill, particularly between Windmill Hill and the Mendips AONB. There are key views from the slopes of Windmill Hill towards the tower of the church. So those are all things which, which do relate to the site. I, I appreciate that, but in terms of the suggestion that Mr. Cook is out there on his own limb because he's reached a different conclusion to everyone else, this isn't in a conclusion about the appeal site, it's a conclusion about a much larger area, and it references attributes which aren't seen on the appeal site. Uh, well, it, it's a conclusion about a different, well, not a different, but a much larger area, but the larger area, as well as including areas which may be more sensitive, such as the AOMB, does include areas which might be less sensitive, such as the main roads and the school. Um, so the, the point of the table is, is that the parish study says it's high sensitivity, as do Ward Armstrong, as do I, uh, Mr. Cook says it's low, so it's not, it's not as if there's a, a minor or, or incremental difference between the assessments. Mr. Cook is at the opposite end of the scale, so I think he is out on his own. Okay, and if you go back to that figure eight, if you wouldn't mind. Tell me when you've got it. Yes. You can see there that the, the areas that have been examined Site CH1 is a vast area which has conclusions that cover the entirety of it. And then we see a number of much smaller, finer grain assessments like LF2, LF4, LF3, ST3, ST2. And it's not particularly clear, is it, why this, the assessment has decided to lump several sites in together and then do much finer grain assessments on other sites, is it? 
Uh, I would imagine if we went to the detailed description and analysis of each of those, I presume the reason for dividing it up in that way is that the people who wrote the report felt that the different areas had different qualities um, and there were different reasons for giving them their levels of sensitivity, but I, I don't know in detail. Um, okay. Um, so, if you're lumping them in together, it makes sense to lump in the school and the site, the appeal site. Uh, I, I don't know what you mean, sorry. I understood that your answer a moment ago as to what I was saying, well, it's not clear why they've done finer green assessments and then these broad brush assessments. And you said, well, as I understood your answer, you're saying, well, they're lumping in the areas where the authors must have thought that they had similar attributes. And I'm saying, well, are you suggesting that the school and the appeal site have similar attributes then? Um, well, I think, I think lumping in might be being slightly unfair to the authors. I'm sure it was a slightly more technical process than that. Um, no, wh what I'm saying is I don't know why, why some areas are larger than others, but I assume if you're doing this kind of study, you would put together areas which you felt had similar characteristics just, or similar levels of sensitivity. I mean, Mr. Etchell has not written the work. Um, just, just bear that in mind in giving, giving your response. We don't, we don't know what the author's intentions were, and I think Mr. neither is Mr. Mr. Etchell, so. I, that what well, in fence my question was we don't know and he said well I has he's yeah. trying to hazard a guess that's why I've, that's, that's why I, I, I've I don't know either from both, from both of you and that's probably where where the answer should perhaps be thank you sir um, let's move on to the um, the NSC sensitivity assessment if you would please um, and again you say that this is another judgment from Ward Armstrong, which disagrees with Mr. Cook. That's core document E5, if you wouldn't mind, please. Yes. And we're going to page 41 in there, please. Yep. Now, tell me if I'm wrong, but the Paragraph 6.3.27, if you can look at it. Yes. It says, Churchill is a large village, large village located to the south of North Somerset with an estimated population of 1,443. It's split into three parts. For ease of description, these three parts are referred to as follows. And then we get the three areas. Correct me if I'm wrong. We don't see anywhere on a map where those three areas are. Uh, yeah, it's map three. Um, and the areas aren't annotated or labelled on the map. But from the description, it seems reasonably clear to me that if you look at map three, that area one is the largest area in the north east, area two is the smallest area in the south, and area three is the part of Churchill Village uh, adjacent to the site. So the, the areas are not, are not areas of landscape, they're, they're the three parts of the settlement. Right. It being Front Street and Dinkhurst for Area 3, again, it's, it's unclear how much that relates to the appeal site, isn't it? Um, I think it's not immediately obvious, but I think if you look at it carefully, I think it is fairly clear. Uh, if you look at the map, there's, there's the three areas with the black line around them from the settlement boundaries. Area three is the one in the west with the black line around it. And so where the assessment talks about the land to the north of area three, it's talking about the appeal site effectively and the land immediately to its east. I see. So when you're looking at map three, you, you, you're taking area three as this area here. I don't know whether you can see from distance. <laughs> Not sorry. very well, but yes, I think so. Are you saying each of these distinct, they're the three areas that it's talking about? Yeah, uh, I think if you read what it says, it, it says Churchill is split into three parts. So it's not, and this is, this is in 6327. It's not talking about the landscape here. The, the parish 
sensitivity assessment divided the landscape around the settlements up. This one, I think, is dividing the settlement of Churchill up. It says Churchill is split into three parts. For easy description, these three parts, so three parts of the settlement, are referred to as follows. Area 1, Area 2, Area 3, with Area 3 being the bit of the settlement to the south and southeast of the site. Centre around Front Street and Dinghurst Road? Yeah. As opposed to Area 2, which is centred around New Road, which is, is the A38, I think, going through the centre of Area 2. I see. So I when we're talking about it, the, the assessment mentioning land to the north. See, the difficulty why I'm struggling with that is Dinghurst Road doesn't follow this line here, does it? It, it says centred around Front Street and Dinghurst Road. Dinghurst Road is, is the southern boundary of that area. So it's not really centred around it, but it, Dinghurst Road is, is one edge of it. I suppose the, the difficulty is that when it's talking about land to the north of Area 3, which is the section you reference, it's unclear what area it's actually looking at. We're making broad assessments as to what the author was really referring to there, aren't we? It, it, yeah, the, that bit of it is, is not immediately clear, but if Area 3 is, as I think it must be, the area with the black line around it to the west of those three, the area to the north of Area 3, uh, the site forms the western end of the area to the north of Area 3, and it, and it does say land to the north of Area 3 slopes up from the settlement edge to Windmill Hill, so that clearly includes the site, because that's what the site does. The difficulty I have with this is because you're trying to say, suggest, well, there's, there's a, a consensus, and Mr Cook is out on his own limb, but actually this consensus you're relying upon, it's unclear and it doesn't actually exist because we've just established going through these documents. They're making assessments about much larger areas. And we agree that the impacts on this site are actually very localised. Yes, I, I agree with you that uh, they are, the, all of the other assessments apart from mine are uh, assessing different areas. The parish one is assessing the area we looked at. The Ward Armstrong one is assessing this area, which is, is slightly unclear as to precisely where the boundaries are, but the general area is clear. Uh, but each assessment says high sensitivity, uh, and I can't see, and Mr Cook can perhaps explain, what it is about the more local area which makes it of so much lower sensitivity than everyone, else, everyone else's assessment of the area which, even though it's of a different area, it's, they are different and larger areas which, which do include the site and they're all said to be of high sensitivity. So I can't see why narrowing it down to say the area within my visual envelope should be of such lower sensitivity. What there is to make it of lower sensitivity, I don't think there's anything. If you just give me a moment, I'm just going to confer with my team. Thank you very much. I've got no further questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Etchells. Um, I've not got any questions. I haven't heard, heard that. I have a short re-examination, sir. Okay, would you uh, like... I just want to... Um, oh, sorry. No. No, I beg your pardon, sir. No, um, no, just carry on. Well, one of the things I need to do, sir, as you'll recall, there was a question asked about the PPG and whether Mr. Eshels had identified the correct paragraph. I'd like to put that correct paragraph in and then ask a question about it, if I may, to begin yeah. my re-examination. Does that reference number match that yeah. that's given in yeah. the... I believe so, so we'll, we'll double check. There was, there was a reference in the
Right, uh, Mr. Eshels, let's begin by just checking that we do indeed, when we read your proof, read the correct paragraph of the PPG. So if I could take you please to page 23 of your proof and ask you to look at paragraph 4.2.10 where you make reference to the PPG uh, and um, cite a particular paragraph which deals with how should development within the setting of national parks, the broads and areas outstanding natural beauty be dealt with. And we see you refer to an ID reference number which is ID 8042-2019-0721 and we look at the reference number that's uh, provided below the paragraph that's been copied off the internet and we see do we the same id number uh, we do yes we, yeah. which is why i was a bit surprised about the point put to me because i i did what you've just done looked it up on the internet and copied and pasted it into the document right well having i having established that you had in fact looked at the ppg and identified the right paragraph um looking at that paragraph uh, to what extent do you say it validates or doesn't validate um, your approach, which is to take account of views towards the AONB when assessing the impact of development on the landscape? Uh, well, it, it, uh, the, the, the paragraph is entitled, How Should Development Within the Setting of AONBs Be Dealt With? And what it says uh, is... Uh, Land within the setting often makes an important contribution. This is especially the case where long views from or to the designated landscape are identified as important. Mm. And they're not only identified as important, they're identified in the AOMB management plan as being one of the special qualities, which is the main thing that you're supposed to preserve about these designated areas. Right, that deals with that point. Next, um, could you please turn up core document E5? which is Glivia, Glivia 3. And if you could I beg your pardon, it's E1, E1. I suspect you've got your own copy. I do. Right. Go to page 14, would you please? And what I'd just like to clear up is what is meant by landscape so that when we come to look at policy CS5, we can orientate ourselves correctly. Could I just invite you to read to yourself, not out loud, paragraphs 2.2 and 2.4 on page 14 and tell me when you've read them, please. Uh, yes, sir, I know what they say anyway. Right, good. Well then, um, let's start with 2.4 and work back. The importance of the ELC definition, which is what you've read at 2.2, is that it moves beyond the idea that landscape is only a matter of, of aesthetics and visual amenity. Instead, it encourages a focus on, the la on landscape as a resource in its own right. I'm not going to read the rest. Now, as you read 2.4, to what extent is it uh, appropriate, in your view, to separate out as entirely separate matters uh, landscape as a matter of aesthetics from landscape as a resource? Uh, well, they, they, they do need to be separated out in terms of the assessment because yeah. the assessment process set out in the GRVIA is, is different, although it's still the same principles in terms of sensitivity and change for landscape and visual effects. But what, what it's saying in 2.4 is that you need to move away from the idea that landscape is only a matter of aesthetics and visual amenity. So clearly it's accepting that it is partly a matter of aesthetics and visual amenity. It's just saying that's, that's not all it is and you also need to look at character. Yes. So just going back to 2.2 and the uh, citation of what the Council of Europe document has to say rather what Swanwick and land use consultants have to say that landscape is all about. Just um, looking at the final sentence, people's perceptions, 
turn land into the concept of landscape now. We know what's gone before, we've read it. People's perceptions. Again, to what extent does that uh, guide you as to the nature of what landscape comprises for the purposes of landscape assessments? Uh, well, it, it, it's saying that the, the perception of it is, is as important as the, the sort of physical quality of the, lands, the, the unperceived landscape with nobody looking at it. And 2.2 says the same thing earlier on. Landscape is an area as perceived by people. Well, we've looked at CS5. I'm not going to go back there. The inspector will have the points. I could take it up with Mr. Cook. So, let us go finally to uh, Wardle Armstrong's uh, sensitivity study. And you were taken to paragraph 6.3.27. Could I just invite you to uh, turn to paragraph 6.3.39, which is a paragraph you started to refer to. 6.3.39, and then were diverted. Just have a read of it, would you? Yes. Now, if one is asking the question, have Wardle Armstrong addressed their minds to the sensitivity of the landscape that comprises the appeal site, does that paragraph assist you in supplying an answer? Yes, it does, because it's specifically saying land to the north of Area 3, which, as we discussed is the, this part of the settlement, slopes up from the settlement edge to Windmill Hill, uh, and it goes on to say, the rising topography increases the visual prominence of this land and there is intervisibility with the OMB. Uh, development on this land would affect the settlement form owing to the above, this land is of high sensitivity. Um, and and that, that isn't just the appeal site, I think it's talking about all of the land between the settlement and Windmill Hill of which the appeal site is the western part, but it clearly includes in a much smaller area there than the overall uh, part they're talking about, because what they're doing here is, even though it's somewhat amorphous in terms of, and unclear in terms of precisely which areas they're talking about, they haven't drawn any lines around them, they do divide it up. They talk about land to the west of Area 3 in the previous paragraph. 6339 is talking about land to the north of Area 3, which is a fairly small area, not much bigger than my visual envelope, and does include the site as a significant part of it. And it says that this land is of high sensitivity. Yeah, no. Just a moment. Nearly finished. Just looking in detail at the 639. Land to the north of Area 3 slopes up from the settlement edge of Windmill Hill. Although, although dense vegetation on field boundaries encloses the fields in this area, the rising topography increases the visual prominence of this land and there's intervisibility with the AMB. In addition, development on this land would affect the settlement form. Now, what, do you th what is your interpretation of that phrase, in addition, development on this land would affect the settlement form. In what way? What do you, what, what, what's being said there? Um, I don't know precisely what they mean. Well then, well, then don't answer the question. Let's stop there. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes the uh, Council's landscape evidence. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Etchells. Um, sorry? Are we allowed to ask a question? Um, I'll, I'll, allow some quest point. I'll allow some questions of the uh, appellant's evidence. Um, but as, as this is the Council's evidence and your effectively 
um, if you like, opposing the scheme in the same way that they are. Uh, no. So, but if if you if you come along tomorrow, I would permit some questions of the tomorrow. appellant's landscape evidence. I can't come tomorrow. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. It's already been done. There's an additional document, sir, that you won't uh, you won't be aware. It's a response from our highways consultant. Oh, uh, apologies. It, it's a response from our highways consultant to the evidence you heard today from Dr. Geecock in respect to highway impacts on Church Street and Front Street. It negates him having to come and give that evidence, but equally, sir, if you feel like you've heard enough, we can ignore that email. Um, so we didn't, we didn't really talk about that. I've got the highways assessment, so I'm, um, I don't think I need any additional evidence being put in. But very well, so we'll, that will have come in. You're more than welcome to just press delete when it comes. Okay. We'll so do. don't generally don't don't just send stuff in yeah. to me. I, whilst I'll welcome it via email, but I want to know about it first. Okay. Um, so yeah, don't just send stuff in and expect me to, to pick it up. Of it's, course, sir. Okay. Um, so that that is everything, isn't it? Okay. Um, so, the attendance sheet, has that been handed uh, back to me? Um, so tomorrow um, we'll start straight away with the uh, appellant's landscape evidence. Um, tomorrow we'll be starting at 9.30. Okay. Um, is anything else that anybody wants to make me aware of that um, there's one matter I'd like to discuss privately with you and Malone and friends, sir. Um, but perhaps we could just have a minute after we formally close the inquiry for today. Yeah. Adjourned, I should say. Yeah. Okay. 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 So um, it's just before quarter to five. Um, so at quarter to five, we'll adjourn until 9.30 tomorrow morning. Thank you, everybody, for your contributions today.